Welcome back to the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. We're joined now by nuclear energy expert Arnie Gunderson. We're going to talk about ongoing concerns of radioactive contamination from Fukushima five years later. Arnie Gunderson is of the organization Fairwinds Energy Education. It's fairwinds.org, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S.org. Gunderson has 45 years of nuclear engineering experience. He was a former senior vice president of a nuclear power corporation turned whistleblower. And this, of course, has sent Arnie Gunderson on quite an interesting trajectory. And he's going to talk to us about his recent trip to Fukushima. Arnie Gunderson, welcome back to the Project Censored Show. Hey, it's nice to be back. I love talking with you guys. Arnie Gunderson, tell us what's going on. You were just in Japan not long ago. What's the scene there? We don't always hear much in the corporate media in the United States, and what we do hear, well, we're not always sure how accurate it is. So what can you tell us? Yeah, I spent a month there. I had been there for six days and then ten days in 2012, but I spent an entire month there this time. And, um, well, I did some really good science. We're still working through all the data, but took over 100 samples of radioactive material. And you know, the bottom line is that even if you assume that Tokyo Electric was doing a good job of cleaning up these little villages, the villages are becoming recontaminated. I was up on the roof of the Minisoma Town Hall, and this is a town of uh, 60,000 people. Girls pedaling to school on their bikes over the drainage ditches that I was measuring and stuff like that. But I'm up on the roof. And um, they had just the year before installed solar collectors up there. And they had cleaned the roof and painted the roof. So I knew there was no contamination when the solar collectors were installed. So I see this pile of dirt under the solar collectors. And I crawl under and take a sample. And it's one of the hottest radioactive samples we've ever seen. So what that's telling us is that these villages are recontaminating themselves. That's alarming information, particularly given Japan, the government there, TEPCO. They're trying to move people back into the prefecture. Yeah, you know, and you know, when you're old like me, it, it probably doesn't matter. But, you know, to see these young kids bike into school and their risk is 10 times higher than an adult and and girls are actually 20 times higher than an adult to see a village that's basically been forcefully repopulated what happens is the government in japan takes away their money and they said well if we paid to resettle you now we're going to take that away but if you go home we'll continue the stipend so they are essentially forcing people back into uh, contaminated areas and, and then worse than that, they, they made the radiation standards 20 times higher than they used to be. It used to be one millisievert, and now it's 20 millisieverts is where they'll allow somebody to move back into. And to put that in perspective, that means that two people in a thousand for every year they're there are going to get cancer as a result of that. This is, uh, you know, if you're there for a life, if you try to build your life there like these little kids, you know, you're looking at 50-50 crapshoot. Arnie Gunderson, certainly the issues in Japan are quite very serious, and it's an issue of social justice, and our theme today is about social justice. We've just uh, finished up a week uh, of social justice activities at Sonoma State University, over 30 hours of various programming activities, and one of the ideas, of course, is local activism ongoing in solidarity with other people around social justice issues worldwide. People at the grassroots, how are they dealing with this? How has this impacted their lives? Yeah, it really is a social justice issue, you know, because the money in this argument is on the, uh, the banks want their money back. They've continued to fund these nuclear plants, even though they've been shut down. The utilities that own the plants want their money back, and they have extraordinary impact on the diet. The diet is like parliament. And the people who the parliament is supposed to represent are getting screwed in the process. We ran into a bunch of mothers, mainly. Essentially, whatever the men feel, they're quiet about it. But the trust between government and women has totally disintegrated. And the anti-nuclear movement in Japan is run by women, which is a phenomenal, wonderful thing on the planet. 
But anyway, they are outgunned by money, you know, sometimes a thousand or ten thousand to one. But that can't stop them. And that's really what's exciting. I think the only thing that's leveled the playing field even a little bit is the internet. You know, the, the big companies and the moneyed backers can't control the internet. And people like Fairwinds and NEARS, Nuclear Information Resource Service, they were on this trip with me too. We have a chance to be heard by the people. So if social justice has any kind of momentum now, it's because I think people can realize that they're not alone. They make somebody feel that, you know, it's just me and everybody else is, is a different way of thinking, then they win. But when they realize there's thousands and ten thousands and hundreds of thousands of like-minded people, I think the Internet changed the balance on this to a degree. So, Arnie Gunderson, the responsibility for Fukushima, is this a nationwide electoral issue in Japan at this point? I wish it was, but no. Abe, who's the new prime minister, has been elected on an aggressive economic policy, and they pulled out of economic doldrums, and you know people are voting their pocketbook. Abe is a man's candidate. The women are still voting against him, but the, the men seem to vote in mass in favor of him. So it's that, and it's also there's some nationalism in this thing. They're talking about changing their constitution so they can go to war. And again, the women are taking up the cudgel here to fight that. But a lot of the men are more nationalistic. So Abe is running on both those themes. He's not discussing nukes. As a matter of fact, his wife is anti-nuke. But he's running on this, the economy's getting a little better, and we need to be more forceful, which scares the crap out of me because they've got so much plutonium in Japan that in a year they could make a, a, at least 100, if not more, nuclear bombs if they wanted to. Well, you know, there's been a rightward shift there, and there's been censorship in the press. There's been chaos surrounding Okinawa, the remilitarization. Some fairly high-profile protests and activism has taken place in Japan around that with Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick, certainly uh, many, many people in Japan. It's good that you're pointing out that many of the women in Japan are the ones sort of at the forefront of these kinds of protests. Yeah, and you know, the Abe regime, is there's a nuclear tie here. There's the Manju reactor, which is a fast breeder reactor that runs on plutonium. It's been delayed 22 times, and the budget is at least 10 times what it used to be. And there's the Rokosho re reprocessing plant. And both of those are, in theory, you know, for the peaceful use of the atom. But in fact, they can churn out an awful lot of plutonium in no time. And I actually think that America wants that as a foil to China. You know, we want to be able to say, look, you know, if if, uh, if we walk away, the, the Japanese can make all the bombs they want. It's a frightening game of chicken we're playing over there. Artie, on March 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle had a featured article where they were reviewing the work of uh, Kai Vetter, uh, a UC Berkeley professor of nuclear engineering, where he had been monitoring radiation levels in water and that the overall view of the story was no cause for worry. Five years after Fukushima meltdown, California coast levels are normal. Were they saying that they had found 50 million becquerels per cubic meter near Japan, and they're only finding two or three becquerels now here in the California coast, which he considered normal? They didn't talk about the levels of fallout radiation after Fukushima that hit California, and all the EPA monitors were turned off. So we don't really got a good reading on that. But they're saying, well, kind of at this point, that's it's happening. Yet mm -hmm. just two months ago, Dar Jamel wrote in Truth Out that these plumes were on their way and scheduled to hit California coast within the next year and that we would see a, a rise. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, first off, Berkeley's nuclear program has been in the forefront of the pro-nuclear propaganda for decades. And since Fukushima has, has been aggressively downplaying the significance of it. So whatever comes out of Berkeley, I, I just attribute to a very pro-nuclear faculty. In that article, too, they also took to Ken Buesler at Woods Hole. And Ken was, he was a little more skeptical than the guys at, uh, at Berkeley. Ken's measuring a thousand miles offshore and he's picking up 10 becquerels per cubic meter. And at my point, that's when uh, my alarm bells go off is, is 10. So, you know, offshore, you know, when you, when you get right up against the coast, 
It's probably uh, that 3-4 kind of Becquerel number is not something I condone, but if somebody wanted to go swimming in it, I guess I'd say, well, you know the risk and, and the benefits, and in your mind you've made that choice. But when you get out 1,000 a a miles out, it's a different story, and that plume is still coming. You know, the, the Pacific's a huge place, and to think that a disaster on the opposite side of the world can be detected and begin to contaminate California, I think that the monumental, shattering conclusion, radiation knows no borders. The, the airborne, you, you were talking about getting hit early on. California, Oregon, and, uh, and Washington got hit early on. The noble gases, xenon and krypton, over Seattle were 400,000 times, not percent, 400,000 times. That's four, 40 million percent higher than they were before the disaster. We picked up uh, hot particles in Seattle. The average person was breathing in about 10 hot particles a day in Seattle down to Portland. A little further south, that would uh, it, it wasn't as bad as that, but we know we've picked up Fukushima radiation in California, too. So there was that spike in you know, March and April and May, and it actually came back around, and, and we picked it up again in June on sort of like a reflection. The radioactive material went around the world and came back a second time. So this dilution is the solution to pollution is what uh, I think Berkeley believes in. And what you can be sure of is that somebody's going to die from the radiation that's in the Pacific, but you just won't know who it is. And they're counting on that. You know, the, the nuclear establishment is saying, well, we can smear that out in a broader epidemiological study so that you won't be able to say that, you know, Jimmy Smith, the one who died of the radiation from Fukushima. Yeah, he had cancer, but we can't prove it. The nuclear industry counts on that when they say, well, it's only three or four becquerels off the coast of California. We're speaking with nuclear energy expert Arnie Gunderson. He is chief engineer at Fairwinds, Fairwinds Energy Education. That's fairwinds.org. He is co-author of the best-selling book in Japan, Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Way Forward. We'll continue our conversation with Arnie Gunderson on the Project Censored show after this brief musical break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. We continue our conversation with nuclear energy expert Arnie Gunderson. And Arnie Gunderson, just back from Fukushima recently on the fifth anniversary of the tragedy there and the disaster there at the Fukushima plant. Arnie, we left off. You were talking about, about the recent articles in the U.S. about UC Berkeley findings and the radiation is not really a problem for people here. But let's do go back to Japan where it is a problem. You mentioned earlier that there was a recontamination and ongoing radiation into the air. Where is this coming from? What's the recontamination coming from specifically? You know, when I was out there, the, uh, you drive down the, the roads and there's 30 million one-ton bags of radioactive trash. And they're putting them all over the place, these huge parks which used to be old rice paddies, filled with 30 million tons of radioactive trash. But that only counts for the individual villages and 20 feet on either side of the road. So every time it rains or every time the wind blows down from the, uh, the mountains, these areas become recontaminated by the stuff that's just next door. I was at a guy's house, and he had a line in his garden, and TEPCO... Tokyo Electric cleaned the right side and said, no, the, the, the other side is safe. And there literally was a line through his garden. And he just laughed. He says, well, what's going to keep that radiation from that side from going over to this side? I was at a guy's house, and right across this little ravine was another house that was uninhabitable. So TEPCO determined that the land on one side of this ravine was uninhabitable, but he could live where he lived. So, you know, we're living in close proximity to extraordinarily high levels of radiation, and it blows in the wind. It gets picked up on tires. Some of the biggest samples I found were in parking lots. People are driving from one area to the other. They carry the stuff. 7-Eleven, the, the convenience store, is a big deal in Japan, and I was sampling the radiation, the, the mats, as you walk into the 7-Eleven. 
And son of a gun, the mats are loaded with radiation, too. So people are trucking it everywhere. And to find it on the fourth floor of the Minnesota Town Hall tells me it's not just on your feet, it's blowing through the air like dust. Arnie Gunderson, could you remind our listeners that not so long ago, a large number of these radioactive soil bags were swept out to sea, and also there's still water being pumped into the Pacific Ocean that is highly radioactive. You know, there's three sources of radiation now into the uh, into the Pacific. Everybody worries about the Fukushima Daiichi site. And, you know, there's three nuclear cores in direct contact with groundwater because the containments are broken and water's flowing in and flowing out. And that groundwater then heads to the Pacific. That's a big source. Then we've got these bags, you know, 30 million bags of radiation that are sitting around. And as it rains, you can actually see the puddles of water, radioactive water, that the trucks are driving through that are spreading it. But the other big source that everybody forgets about is the mountain range down the center of Fukushima Prefecture, the state of Fukushima. The entire mountain range is contaminated. So every time it rains, you know, even if the one square mile of Fukushima Daiichi site is excluded, you're taking the whole mountainside and running that into the rivers, which goes right out into the Pacific. And I was just appalled at how little has been done in the mountains. We chased a monkey. These mountains have snow monkeys, and we were up to our knees in snow. We followed a monkey up into the forest and, and measured his poop. His poop was measuring 50,000 becquerels per kilogram. So he's eating it from the trees. You know, it's all over the place. And there's no way that any nation can, can clean a mountain range. It's just an incredibly difficult proposition. So the solution over there is to raise the standard. Where When it used to be one millisiever, now it's 20. That's how they pass the risk off on the population so that the owners of these power plants don't have to pay the cost. That's quite amazing. We now know that Japan has spent 60% more on fossil fuel imports in 2013 than they did in 2010, and that has put their balance of payments with the U.S. reversed it, $270 billion. So they're buying a lot of coal from the U.S. and oil, of course, and it's changed the trade impact, and their electricity has gone up 20%. Cost. So there's certainly been an economic impact that's been favorable to the U.S. in one sense. You're right. They have had to, first off, they reduce the need for power by 19%, which is just astronomical. But then on top of that, you know, they did have 50 power plants shut down, so they fired up some old coal plants and continued to uh, to keep the lights on. But, you know, it's been five years. So they've had 50 nuclear plants shut down for five years. The average plant's got uh, seven, 800 people. They're all pretty well paid. Um, let's say 100000 bucks a person. So you're looking at a payroll cost per plant per year of pushing less than a billion, but, but pushing the high hundreds of millions of dollars. There's 50 of these plants. So the banks have ponied up something on the order of between 50 and 100 billion to keep these idle plants employed. Boy, you know, a hundred billion dollars could build an awful lot of solar collectors. And the Japanese didn't want to do that. They chose to basically fund people to do nothing for five years and import all the coal that they wanted. To my mind, they made the wrong choice. They still have a chance to turn it around, but they've squandered away five years when they had a lot of political goodwill where people had made sacrifices and understood that the sacrifices were necessary, and and they squandered it away. Arnie Gunderson, there are 23 plants in the U.S. built the same way as the Fukushima plant, and of course we know the history there with General Electric and the U.S. pushing nuclear energy on the Japanese after World War II. You know, Brian Covert did an excellent study on that for one of our books a couple years back. But really, we're looking at more possibilities for disasters in the future here in the United States because of similar issues. And could you highlight, say, Hurricane Sandy or also, you know, sort of the toxic waste in groundwater and things that are that are associated with these aging plants? You know, all of America's plants are aging. Uh, the average age of a nuke in America is, I think, 33 years old now. And the average age of an American is less than that. So to think that these, quote, modern, this modern technology is older than the average age of an American is pretty darn amazing. 
There's 23 plants just like Fukushima Daiichi, a bunch of them right near Chicago. And then on top of that, the other 60 or so are also aging. But let's look at the, the ones that are identical. The NRC staff, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission staff, came up with a decision that they should be able to vent these containments. In other words, when the containment looks like it's about ready to burst, we don't want to lose the containment, so we'll open a valve and we'll vent it. But we'll harden vent it. We'll put it through special filters and special seismic constraints and all this kind of stuff to suck out most, if not all, of the radiation. So that was the staff's decision. And the five commissioners overrode their own staff. So 4,000 people on the staff say, we really need to make these plants safer with hardened vents. And the NRC just overrode their own staff because they knuckled under the pressure, the economic pressure that the nuclear industry was applying through Congress. So Sandy is a perfect example. Sandy hit, and I actually picked it on uh, Democracy Now! the day before. I said, you know, Oyster Creek is in the bullseye here. And son of a gun, Oyster Creek was in a refueling outage like Daiichi Unit 4 when Sandy hit. And they lost all their power. So the fuel pool in the refueling outage does not get its electricity from emergency sources. So they lost the cooling to the fuel pool. Now the fuel pool is starting to heat up and up and up and up and up. So the owner of the plant ran around and lined up some fire trucks and had them connected up to water tanks. And they were just about ready to start pushing in water into the uh, fuel pool when the electricity came back on. So that was, uh, to my mind, that was a near miss. The, the, the tide had risen to the point where it was within six inches of wiping out the emergency core cooling pumps. Now that's supposed to happen once every 10,000 or 20,000 years. And it's happened in, you know, it happened in 40 years at Oyster Creek. So, yeah, we've had our near misses, and, you know, everybody just kind of whistles by the graveyard every time they happen. And change doesn't come quickly, as we all know, Arnie Gunderson. So what are your prescriptions about these ongoing threats from nuclear energy? Well, I think the first thing is we shouldn't build anymore. They just are not economical. You know, let's take all the safety concerns off the table and talk about money. The two new nukes being built or proposed to be built, one at Hinkley Point in England and one at North Anna in Virginia, are going to cost around 19 cents a kilowatt, and you can get solar for two. Now, you know, do the math here. Nuclear has priced itself out of the of the market, so we shouldn't be even considering building new ones. But the other thing is, if your readers want to shut down nuclear power, the way to do it is to put a single solar collector on your roof. You don't have to go big time and spend a lot of money, but nuclear plants still make their money at the summer peak, the hottest part of the day, from noon until 4, when the air conditioning loads are the highest. And that's when the demand is highest, and they sell into that demand. If everybody went out and bought a solar collector, it would drop the demand and drop the prices, and the nukes wouldn't make any money. So, you know, let's shut them down economically. Arnie Gunderson, your website is fairwinds.org, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot O-R-G. People can go there and learn more at your Fairwinds Energy Education site. And uh, could you leave us with any last words here for today's program? We've been focusing on social justice and environmental justice. Anything else you'd like to add on that front? My impression of what's going on in Japan is the gross inhumanity of the government of Japan toward its people. Time after time, when the choice is to be made, or should the people be protected or should we make a boatload of money, the boatload of money always wins. And I, I think that's a national and also an international story that you guys need to cover every month. Well, we're certainly doing our best to keep up with what's going on, Arnie Gunderson, and we appreciate you, Maggie Gunderson, and the Fairwinds organization for trying to keep us up to date on that. And we work with Fukushima Response here and John Bertucci and, and so many other folks. And it's, it's, um, it's again, it's, it's heartening to know that people are really out there working on the front lines to tell us what's really going on. So thank you for your work, Arnie Gunderson. All right. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks, Peter. Three, one, three, one.